Fire mages and arms warriors are obviously on a different level than other specs in Shadowlands. Some people have even joked that these classes feel like they are level 70 when you queue into them in Arena, and we agree. Mages and warriors are truly the god classes of Shadowlands. If you need more convincing, check out their representation in PvP. They are by far the most popular and high performing specs on the Arena ladder. Today, we're going to show you that even the gods can bleed by giving you some essential tips on how to counter these classes. Throughout this video, we will be putting your game knowledge to the test. We will give you four questions, and based on how many you get right, you can score yourself from Challenger to Gladiator. Do you think you have the knowledge of a Gladiator player? Well, let's find out. But first, we have a question for you all. Do you think there is a god tier healer in Arena currently? Holy Priests are becoming one of the most popular healers, and for good reason. They have some of the best cooldowns, the best damage, and the best control out of any healer. Are they the healing gods of Season 1? Let us know what you think in the comments below. Before we get into today's video, if you're struggling against mages and warriors, or if you haven't achieved the rating you wanted this season, check out skillcap.com slash wow. There you'll find classes, courses, and matchup guides designed by some of the best players in the world. Our videos will break down the fundamental arena concepts, giving you insight from pro players and rank 1 gladiators. We have videos available for every class and are adding new videos every week. Joining our website will give you instant access to all of our videos, as well as an invite to our premium discord, where you can directly interact with pro players and get immediate answers to all of your PvP questions. If you want to take your gameplay to the next level, be sure to check out skillcap.com slash wow to Today. There is a lot of confusion as to what needs to be interrupted against fire mages, and there is one spell in particular that many players forget to interrupt, and it is losing them games. That brings us to our first gladiator quiz question. What is the maximum amount of spell schools a fire mage can have in arena? Now think hard about this one because it's a little bit tricky. They obviously have fire and arcane, but how many spell schools can they have in total? If you answered three, well you missed out on one. They can actually have up to four. The most obvious ones are Fire and Arcane, but if a mage is playing Ring of Frost and Night Fae with Shifting Power, they have a total of four spell schools they can be interrupted on. And let's focus on Shifting Power for a second, because it is one of the most overlooked abilities to interrupt against Fire Mages. Most people know by now that it reduces cooldowns during its channel, but for many players, the 10 second cooldown reduction doesn't seem like much. What people don't know about is the conduit called Discipline of the Grove, which increases the recovery rate even further. On top of that, many mages are starting to play with a talent called Kindling over Meteor, which reduces the cooldown of Combustion every time Fire Blast is used. Considering that Shifting Power resets the cooldown on both Combustion and Fire Blast, mages double dip on Combustion cooldown reduction every time Shifting Power is used. So what does this mean for you? It means you should start using Interrupts on Shifting Power. It's one of the most broken Covenant abilities, and many players, including Rank 1 teams, completely ignore it. Not only does it reduce the cooldown of Combustion, but also other important mage spells like Counterspell, Ice Block, Alter Time, and Dragon's Breath. And we can't talk about Fire Mages without talking about Combustion. Playing around Combustion is one of the most important parts of countering Fire Mage. This might seem basic, and that's because it is, but it is also one part of gameplay that people struggle with the most. Combustion isn't just one cooldown, it's two. With most mages playing Rune of Power, not only does Combustion boost crit chance and mastery, but it also automatically casts Rune of Power and procs Infernal Cascade. The best way to counter Combustion is with a dispel, but if you can't immediately dispel it, you need to trade a defensive cooldown or CC the enemy mage. Fire mage burst happens really quickly, so you have to be quick in reacting with a defensive. If nothing is available, a really good option is to line of sight during combustion. Some of you might be thinking though, why is line of sighting so good against combustion? Isn't most of his damage instant cast? That brings us to our next gladiator question, why is line of sighting so effective versus combustion even if the damage is instant? We will give you some time to think about it. But if you haven't worked it out by now, it's because of Rune of Power. By line of sighting, you usually force the mage to leave their Rune of Power, which dramatically decreases their damage. You should look out for Rune of Power in Arena and force the enemy mage to leave it as often as possible. Now let's break down some gameplay showing you exactly how a rank 1 team plays around combustion and shifting power. Here you can see the enemy mage has popped combustion, which means that it will need to be dispelled as quickly as possible. The mage in our team quickly reacts with a panda racial, incapacitating the enemy mage. At the same 
time, our priest uses Guardian at the Ret Paladin, making sure that the Paladin won't die to any sudden combustion damage. Now the Paladin has a defensive cooldown protecting them from combustion, and the enemy mage is CC'd. This prevents the enemy mage from getting value from their CD. During the incapacitate on the enemy mage, our priest does a dispel, removing the combustion almost instantly. If we skip ahead a few seconds, we can see the enemy mage go for a Ring of Frost. This cast gets interrupted by our Ret Paladin almost immediately, but the enemy mage uses Shifting Power. Since it is on the nature tree, it can be used while being locked out of Fire, Frost, or Arcane. Our priest recognizes this and immediately cancels their cast to stop Shifting Power with a Chastise. As you can see, not only are rank 1 teams really quick at denying combustion, but they are also aware of how strong Shifting Power is. Interrupting Shifting Power is often ignored by lower rated players, but once you start actively countering it, you will do so much better against mage teams. One thing that players often overlook is how much you can punish fire mages with offensive spells. By now you probably already know how important it is to dispel combustion, but have you ever focused on dispelling their shields and altar time? Despite wearing cloth, many people consider mage one of the tankiest classes in the game, and a lot of that has to deal with triune ward and altar time. The truth is, outside of their barriers and altar time, they are incredibly vulnerable. On top of that, a significant portion of their damage is also dispellable. The hot streak buff that gives fire mages instant cast pyroblast is dispellable, meaning you can shut down a huge part of their defense and damage by slamming dispel. This was evident in a recent AWC series where Golden Guardians played triple dispel into Charlotte Phoenix, killing the enemy mage and keeping their damage below the holy paladin on their team. They did this by slamming dispel on the mage, removing their defenses by purging barriers, and denying their offense by dispelling their instant cast pyroblasts. To show how vulnerable mages are without their barriers, let's look at a team bursting into a mage with all their shields up. As you will see, despite our elemental shaman getting a full lightning lasso onto the enemy mage, they barely put a dent into their HP. This is because the mage has full shields on them when the cast starts, effectively denying the burst damage from the kill attempt. Now, let's see how much more damage the same team is able to do when the shields are purged before bursting. Here, you can see the enemy mage has been put into a chastise at 85% HP. With our shaman and mage turreting their damage, you can see the enemy mage drop low. Once they come out of the chastise, they immediately press their shield, giving them huge damage protection while their priest is stuck in a polymorph. Instead of dumping more damage into the enemy mage, our team uses their multiple offensive dispels to quickly remove shields. With each shield providing several thousand HP, it is worth it to use your instant dispels to remove these shields as quickly as possible. Although removing shields does not deal direct damage to the mage, it indirectly pressures them by removing their primary defense. And with their shields instantly removed, the enemy mage is in a super vulnerable position. Even after their priest manages to escape CC, the mage is still under huge pressure. With their shields removed, mages are super vulnerable. You should track the cooldown of their barriers with an add-on like weak auras or omnibar, making sure you remove their shields before you go for burst. If you can remove their barriers the moment they use them, you should look to pressure the enemy mage while their shields are on cooldown. Don't try and burst into shields, but instead, focus on playing around them by timing your burst when they aren't available. Now we will cover some healer-specific positioning that you should use against fire mages. One of the difficulties when playing against mages is the Shimmer talent, which allows them to use Polymorph during their blink. This can make positioning really difficult, especially combined with the threat of Dragon's Breath Sheep. One simple workaround for this problem is to be as far from the Fire Mage as possible, especially against comps like RMP. This will force the enemy team to waste time moving across the map to CC you, delaying some of their setup. On top of that, you should respect the threat of Blink, DB, Sheep whenever Dragon's Breath is available. If you are forced to be at Pillar, the best position is on the corner of the pillar, ducking in and out of line of sight of your partners, allowing you to quickly line the mage if they blink in for a sheep. At the start of this clip, you can see that our priest has been put into a shadowy duel from the enemy rogue. They don't have many cooldowns left, so our druid must try and avoid a CC chain. Even though it is hard to see, the enemy mage is starting to push up to our pillar. If we look at the cooldown bar on the bottom of the screen, you can see that Dragon's Breath is off cooldown. With the mage pushed up and DB ready, our druid must react quickly to a blink DB. Our druid manages to sneak a re-stealth and positions on the corner of the pillar. Remember that against mages, it's important to position yourself in the corner of a pillar, allowing allowing you to quickly duck out of line of sight of Blink. Our druid quickly uses a heal and immediately ducks out of the line of sight of the enemy mage. This baits the mage's blink and allows the druid to instantly evade the dragon's breath. So if you're playing as a healer against a fire mage, try positioning at the corners of pillars, staying out of the line of sight of your mage, and ducking in and out to heal your partners. Playing like this will allow you to avoid blink CC from the enemy mage while allowing you to heal your teammates. 
Finally, we have some general tips against fire mages that many players ignore. The first is to track the cooldown of Kleptomania, especially if you're also a mage or pretty much any class with important buffs. Tracking the cooldown of Kleptomania allows you to play around it more effectively and prevent your important spells from being countered. This includes things like demons, soul for warlocks, power infusion for priest, or overgrowth for resto druid. By tracking the cooldown of Kleptomania, you can see when it's safe to use these spells in arena without dealing with a quick dispel. Finally, although it isn't played in every matchup, you should also learn to play around Meteor. The damage from this ability is split among all targets that it hits, meaning you can soak damage on your partners by standing in its AoE circle before Meteor lands. On top of that, if you're the only target in the circle, move out of it immediately. PvE isn't the only place where you need to move out of the fire. Now it's time to stance dance into the warrior class, first by showing you how to abuse their mobility. One of the biggest mistakes players make against warriors is getting hit by them. To quote one of my favorite gaming lines of all time, if you want to win, just don't get hit. Jokes aside, this is a fundamental concept that so many players mess up. They don't respect the warrior's mobility and damage, forcing them to use defensives at unnecessary times. Not getting hit involves two core gameplay adjustments. The first is to play around charge and heroic leap. If you're a monk or a warlock, you might want to avoid using your port or gateway until after the warrior has used their mobility spells, specifically heroic leap since it can be used to connect to targets on a different Z axis or targets that are out of LOS. Let's see how a rank 1 destruction warlock abuses war warrior mobility. And just as a warning, if you play warrior, what you're about to see might disturb you. The enemy warrior makes the correct play of opening with a storm bolt on the warlock. This will allow them to develop instant pressure on our warlock without having to burn a charge. Unfortunately, toward the end of the storm bolt, the enemy warrior gets put into a full chastise, allowing our warlock to get some distance. The warrior immediately charges after the chastise, but our warlock reacts with their portal. Now, with the warrior snared from Curse of Exhaustion, the only gap closer they have left is their heroic leap. The warrior uses their heroic leap to reconnect to the warlock, and with another quick reaction, our warlock instantly gateways away. Now, with both charge and heroic leap down, the warrior has really bad mobility and is unable to fully reconnect on the warlock. If we skip forward a bit, you can see that the enemy warrior gets frustrated and charges to our priest once it becomes available. But once the warrior does this, our holy priest uses gateway, teleporting across the map. Now, with the warrior max range from our team, we are able to develop our pressure. As you can see, with the right tools, you can really abuse the limited mobility of arms warriors. You should look to play around their charge and heroic leap using your gap creators after they use their gap closers. This will give you better positioning overall and will dramatically reduce the damage you take. Of course, not every class has tools like portal or gateway, but in any case, focusing on keeping the warrior away from you will dramatically reduce their pressure. Another big mistake that players specifically make in 2v2 against warriors is to stay in and attack them. Warriors are really tanky and do more raw pressure than most melee classes. By attacking them for too long, you're playing into their strengths. Instead, you should hit them during stuns or when they're in battle stance and then pull away and kite when your pressure is gone. Don't stay in against warriors. Avoid their damage when you don't have pressure to apply. Let's look at how a rogue mage uses a hit and run strategy to counter an enemy warrior. At the start of this clip, our rogue used shadowy duel on the enemy paladin. But now that the go is over, our rogue should actively try and avoid damage from the enemy warrior. Even though the enemy warrior is attacking our rogue, there is no no reason to stay in and try and counter with damage. A sub rogue will never out damage a warrior 1v1, so the more optimal approach is to avoid damage until we have CC ready for the enemy paladin. As you can see, our rogue has done a good job kiting the warrior and avoiding damage. And now the enemy warrior is in battle stance with a full polymorph on their paladin, giving us a perfect opportunity to reverse pressure. And with the warrior baited into battle stance from this hit and run strategy, our team pulls the trigger on a go, forcing trinkets from both the druid and paladin, and even forcing blessing of protection onto the warrior. As you can see, using a hit and run strategy is highly effective against warriors, allowing you to avoid a lot of damage while delaying the game long enough to find an opportune time to reverse pressure. There's one advanced mobility trick against Venthyr warriors, and that is to stay below 80% while kiting them. Which brings us to our next gladiator question. Why should you stay below 80% HP when you are trying to kite a Venthyr warrior? The answer is because of Condemn and Death Sentence. Most Venthyr warriors play Death Sentence, allowing them to use Condemn as a gap closer against targets above 80%. If you really want to outplay Venthyr warriors, try to stay below 80% while you're kiting them. This will prevent them from using Condemn to reconnect. And on the topic of limiting their pressure, one of the things you need to be focusing on against warriors is forcing them into defensive stance. Warrior pressure is high even in defensive stance, and if you consider that their damage is 10% lower in D stance, you can see why it's important that they are never able to do 
do damage while in battle. The best way to force them into D stance is to constantly threaten them, even if they are not the primary kill target. Most warriors will instinctively press D stance the moment they start taking significant damage, and if they refuse to switch stances, then they become a really good target without the passive damage reduction in defensive stance. You should look to punish warriors who sit battle stance by pressuring them enough to force CDs or enough to force the swap into defensive stance. If you played last expansion, I'm sure you are well aware of this spell icon, but what if I told you that warriors also have Vendetta, except it's AoE and on a 45 second cooldown? Most players are aware of Warbreaker or Colossus Smash, but only the best players know that they need to play around it. Just think about it for a second. If you saw an Assassination Rogue press Vendetta, you would probably react with a defensive cooldown, so why aren't you doing the same with Warbreaker? They're both 30% damage increases, except unlike Vendetta, Warbreaker can hit multiple targets. You should first make sure that you are able to track Warbreaker with an add-on like Weak Auras or Omnibar. That way, you can easily see when it's pressed. When a warrior uses Warbreaker, you should try and mitigate damage, ideally by CCing the warrior or by using a defensive cooldown. Now, let's combine the concepts we just discussed to see how a rank 1 player abuses warrior mobility, respects Warbreaker, and forces defensive stance. Our monk is using the same hit and run strategy we discussed earlier, avoiding damage from the warrior as much as possible. Monks, just like rogues, will get out pressured by enemy warriors if they try and square up toe to toe, which means the best strategy is to simply kite the warrior in between setups. As you can see, the enemy warrior gets greedy and goes into battle stance, and if we look at our monk's debuffs, you can see that they have Colossus Smash, which is the debuff from Warbreaker. With Leg Sweep available, now is the perfect time to stun and pump out damage. Not only will it punish the warrior for being in battle stance, but it will also help avoid damage from Warbreaker. With the warrior in battle, now is the perfect time to use our stun and pop our cooldowns. Even though the warrior survives this go, it winds up forcing Die by the Sword, which is a good trade overall for our monk. Had our monk not stunned the Warbreaker, the warrior would have easily overwhelmed our team with raw pressure from Warbreaker and Battle Stance. You should always respect Warbreaker by CCing the Warrior when it is up or by trading a defensive cooldown. Finally, in order to fully counter Warriors, you need to respect Intervene. This spell is arguably the strongest team defensives in the game and is capable of completely shutting down kills. Not only does it mitigate melee damage, but it also reduces damage taken by the target with the Safeguard Conduit. What this means is that you should never pop cooldowns into a target with Intervene unless you are 100% certain you will score the kill. Ideally, you should wait until Intervene is on a cooldown before doing a setup, or make sure you have the Warrior in CC before your kill attempt, assuming that the Warrior has Intervene available. Now, let's see how a Spell Cleave plays around Intervene. Here, we have a guy comp playing against Turbo Cleave. With a full polymorph secured on the enemy paladin, the warrior immediately intervenes his shaman. This gives the shaman the safeguard buff, reducing damage as well as giving them spell reflection from the overwatch pvp talent. And despite the paladin being in a full sheep, the god comp does not use their damage. With intervene up on the shaman, a huge portion of the damage will be deflected. And given how powerful enhancement shaman healing is, we need to be looking for a perfect setup to 100 to 0, so we must wait for the intervene to end. And now, with intervene gone on the enemy shaman, our team is able to land a cyclone on the enemy paladin and use a silence on the shaman, preventing them from healing. This winds up paying off as the god comp lands a quick kill on the enemy shaman. Had they tried to damage into to intervene, it is incredibly likely that the kill would have been deflected. Pay attention to intervene in arena as it can completely shut down your kill attempts. Play around it by CCing the warrior before a setup or waiting for intervene to end before using your burst. Finally, we have some general tips against warriors that you might already know but are easy to forget about. The first is just avoiding stacking for intimidating shout. Sometimes it's inevitable and you can't avoid getting AoE feared with your teammates, but you should try and play around intimidating shout as much as possible. The best way to do this is to simply keep track of its cooldown and spread apart as a team whenever it's available. If you get AoE feared with your teammates, you are giving the warriors team a 3v1 setup which can be very punishing. Additionally, you should also be aware of sharpened blade, especially as a healer. Many players over look this ability, wasting valuable healing cooldowns into targets that have a 50% healing reduction. In order to play around Sharpened Blade, be sure to track its cooldown and be sure not to waste spells like Nature's Swiftness, Exhilaration, or Health Stone while a Sharpened Blade Mortal Strike is active. And last but certainly not least, make sure you are playing around Spell Reflection. In Shadowlands, not only can warriors spell reflect themselves, but they can also spell reflect their teammates, either with the Overwatch PvP talent or the Misshapen Mirror Legendary. Some warriors will play with a combination of both of these, and it can be really frustrating to deal with. Regardless if the warrior is playing Overwatch or has the Misshapen Mirror Legendary, the counterplay is the same. Intervene requires the warrior to be within 25 yards of the target, and the Misshapen Mirror only affects the closest ally to the warrior. 
What this means is that you can use the positioning of the warrior to determine whether or not it is safe to use a spell on the enemy target. If the warrior is within 25 yards of his partner and has intervened up, you probably should juke your spell cast on their partner to avoid spell reflection. On top of that, you should be very selective as to what spells you should use to get rid of spell reflection. Ideally, you want to use an instant cast spell that would have no negative effect on you if it gets reflected. This brings us to our final gladiator quiz question. Say a destruction warlock is playing against a warrior and needs to remove spell reflection. Here are some instant cast spells the warlock could use to get rid of spell reflection. Would it be Conflag, Curse of Exhaustion, or Curse of Weakness? If you said Curse of Weakness, you're correct. Using Conflag would waste an important damaging spell, and using Curse of Exhaustion would put a slow on the Warlock. The best choice would be Curse of Weakness, which only reduces physical damage attack speeds. This has no negative effect on the Warlock, so it is the best choice for removing spell reflection. And there you have it. Those are some of the most important tips for countering Fire Mages and Arms Warriors. How well did you do on our Gladiator quiz? Were you able to answer all four questions correctly and score a Gladiator rank? Some of them were quite hard, so don't worry if you didn't get every one of them right. Warriors and mages are everywhere on the ladder, so you need to know how to counter them. By using some of the tips in this video, you're guaranteed to have more success when you fight these god classes. If you like this video, make sure to give us a like and subscribe with all notifications turned on to be instantly notified every time we upload. As always, thanks for watching, see y'all soon.